Welcome to the Seedfield Podcast, the show where Antiochians share their knowledge, tell their stories, and come together to win victories for humanity. I'm your host, Jasper Nighthawk. Last week, we released the final episode of season two, and we're nearing the one year anniversary of our founding of this podcast. To cap off a great year for the Seedfield Podcast, our editor Lauren Instinus and I wanted to do something special and a little different. So we're putting together three mini episodes, mini-sodes, if you will, that revisit interviews from this season and pull out the themes that consistently run through them. The themes we've seen emerge in our conversations this year really go back to the core of Antioch's mission. I wanna actually read that mission statement out loud because it's really good and also it's just one sentence long. Antioch University provides learner-centered education to empower students with the knowledge and skills to lead meaningful lives and to advance social, economic, and environmental justice. I really like that whole sentence, and especially the last part. I do think that what sets Antioch apart from many other universities is its explicit dedication to advancing social, economic, and environmental justice. This really goes back to our first president, the famous education reformer Horace Mann, who told the first graduates of Antioch to, quote, be ashamed to die before you've won some victory for humanity. In today's Antioch, you can see this directive placed at the core of everything we do. For instance, we use it as the tagline for this podcast. And in a broader sense, this rallying cry inspires teachers to do their best to prepare students to join today's most pressing challenges. These questions of how to create more social, economic, and environmental justice are what drive this show and keep us excited to make it. Because we get to talk to scholars and educators and students and alumni who are passionately and brilliantly involved in solving them. So for the next three episodes, we're going to look back at how guests this season address these problems. For today's mini-sode, I'm going to look at the creative ways Antiochians are tackling questions of environmental justice and education. Learning about environmental justice can start in the classrooms of our youngest students. John Garfunkel, who teaches in the education program at Antioch, Seattle, told us about an aspect of environmental justice that isn't always emphasized, looking closely at food. For myself, when I was in elementary school and through high school and even into college, eating was always this thing that was separate from learning. It happened during breaks or at lunch. And I think the only time food entered the classroom was if we'd earned a pizza party for good behavior. But maybe that was a missed opportunity on my teacher's part. And what we realize is that doing things through food can accomplish things that we often think we can accomplish without food, but through food, either accomplish it in a better way, more successful way, more enduring way, more sustainable way. And that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned, and I think we collectively in all this work have learned, is that through food, we can address issues of climate change, economic injustice, racial injustice, so many problems that we have in the world can be accomplished without food, but through food, they can be accomplished for the very reasons you were just giving that example. It brings people together. It's that notion of convivium, you know, community through food, food through community. The key here, as John told our guest host, Mayor Allen, is to help students see how what they eat is connected and part of global food chains and ecosystems and environments and really the wider world. In some ways, food is the most tangible and intimate way that we can interact with our environment. And ultimately, in his quest to bring edible education to students around the country, John is working to help students leave the place of passive consumption and instead become active participants in preparing and even cultivating their own food. John believes that this is something that everyone can do, even with extremely modest resources. 
reclaiming uh, the commons or one's own personal public space, uh, space from you know parking strip in front of one's yard to an empty building or even parts of parks that are unused. Even public spaces like fence lines that go across uh, public institutions. The idea of using those places and reclaiming them or repatriating them as places to grow food is as much a political act as anything else. And I think in this day and age, statements like that send powerful, diverse messages to numbers of different stakeholders about the importance of those places, the use of those places, and the opportunity to grow food in places that serve the public, not just ourselves. This idea came up again and again through these conversations that going outside, seeing what's there, and getting your hands dirty can be liberatory and transformative. Here's Ellen Doris, faculty at Antioch, New England, talking about outdoor education. When we spend time outdoors, one of the things that we see is how intricately everything is connected and how we're part of it all. So I guess I'd like listeners to remember that they're part of it all and important and that we each have work to do and things to offer and joy to find. And even small moments outside can help us on our way. And here's Jim Jordan from Antioch, New England, talking about how important it was for him as a child to be taken outside to go to specific places and to learn about the world. You know, when you're in grade school, you take field trips, and I did too. And some of them, a few of them just resonate with me to this day. You know, maybe eight or nine years old, 10 years old, it had nothing to do with environmental studies, but they were out in the field. And I, boy, I just viscerally remember some of the things you're looking at, some of the experiences. Just, it's transforming, it sticks with me. I love how these teachers we talked with emphasized over and over how important it was to foster in young people this interest and this sense of wonder and love of the outdoors. In our conversation with Ellen, we also got to talk with Liza Lowe, who teaches at Antioch, New England, and runs our Inside Outside Network. She told us about how during the coronavirus pandemic, many teachers have begun bringing their students outside. There have been so many more teachers who are interested, who have come to um, nature-based education or outdoor learning because really early on, we knew that being outside, sort of the transmission of COVID was a, a lot lower. It was a less concern, right? Because of the airflow and whatever outdoors. And so just taking your students outside was a safer place to be. So there were a lot of teachers who jumped on board because of that. However, once they started taking their students outside, I think it was pretty quick that they noticed the benefits, right? And one of the things that we often talk about is children who don't thrive as learners inside a, a typical classroom go outside and all of a sudden, not only their teachers and the other adults in the school, but their peers also see them shine and they can like recognize how, oh, this child who I didn't realize has this strength. It moves my heart a little bit to think of a young person who's having trouble in school, finding their strength outside. And another of our guests, Don Murray, who teaches at Antioch Online, sees the same potential to reach learners in new ways when she leads her college level students into the field. So we would meet, you know, at various locations at a mountain, at a beach, at a river, at a lake, and just um, learn about conservation issues, ecology, endangered species, managing those areas. There is something very inspiring, very for kinesthetic and visual learners, you know, something so important about being in the field, seeing the plant, touching it, smelling the land, the dirt, seeing the landscape that just settles with them and it's something they don't forget. And here's Jim again, taking what Don said even further. I 
I think just as important is the building of community that just is unparalleled in a curriculum to go and spend time with a group of people and become colleagues uh, and, and visit with uh, experts in the field, with indigenous groups, with stakeholders, and really gel together as a group of folks on this learning endeavor is unparalleled. It's transformative. Finding and creating opportunities to connect with the world around us, both the land and everything that lives on it, and to do this in a supportive learning environment, it truly benefits everyone. Whether through doing field studies somewhere far from home or planting tomatoes in our backyards, these experiences leave us with newfound strengths and knowledge. And maybe most importantly, they give us a greater appreciation for the land and communities that sustain us. Thanks for listening to our first mini-sode exploring the larger themes running through the Seedfield podcast. I hope you'll join us next week when our editor Lauren Instanes takes us on a dive into mental health justice at Antioch. For full show notes, as well as transcripts, prior episodes, and more, visit our website, theseedfield.org. The Seedfield podcast is produced by Antioch University. Our editor is Lauren Instanes. A special thanks to Karen Hamilton and Melinda Garland. Thank you for spending your time with us today. That's it for this episode. We hope to see you next time. And don't forget to plant a seed, sow a cause, and win a victory for humanity. From Antioch University, this has been the Seed Field Podcast. Podcast.